And welcome back to another edition of the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. And I guess it's only fair. I guess it's only fair that I actually am end up in the screen this time. DJ has been in there once. Arch has been in there once. No doubt. And I guess turn. it's Fellas, how we doing? <laughs> we good, man. I mean, you're out in London living your best life. And, you know, we're in the studios. I guess we all have had our turn, like you said. But, uh. You know, all is good. I mean, Arch may not be good. His, his alma mater is not playing well, so oh, he okay. may be a little salty. Yeah, this after you you guys drilled Missouri. Hey, man. So, hey, uh, hey, uh, hey. <laughs> ugly wins matter. <laughs> ugly wins matter. You did, you did win, and, you, and Minnesota uh, lost, so you're right. I'm the only one with a dub? That's great. Okay, there you go. There's our <laughs> now, college. In our uh, pre-show conversations, I can tell you that Arch is in a very good mood. That's what that's what happens when the Falcons get a victory. Uh, yes. No, uh, I am in London this week. Uh, fortunate to be covering a couple of games here for Westwood One National Radio. Of course, had uh, Minnesota and the Saints this past weekend. Of course, that game was somewhat boring in the first three quarters. Got exciting in the last quarter. A couple of long field goals deciding that game. And then I'm staying out here all week. Got the Giants and the Packers this Sunday, and then I'll be making my maiden voyage home. So yeah. I, I went out for a walk today, guys. I went down to Buckingham Palace. I went down to Big Ben. I stopped at a, a really cute coffee shop. Actually, does that kind of take my man card away? Just Absolutely. Really as soon as you say cute coffee <laughs> shop, I was like, whoa, Rack. Whoa. But I had to stop there. I had to stop there because it was such a London place to go to. All right. Without further ado, let's get into what we're talking about today. Let's to talk about a Falcons victory. Let's talk about first reactions. I'm going to have the guys give us their MVP from the game this past week and what it took from the Falcons defense and the offense. And then, of course, we will switch gears and we will. We'll fast forward ahead of that as the Falcons travel down to Tampa to face the Buccaneers. And Arch's so favorite game, the Buccaneers coming off a loss. They're going to play really upset, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that seems to matter a whole lot. So, yeah. all right, let's 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 start it off. Dave, I want you to tell us who is your MVP from the game. There's a number of options. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's somewhat easy. Who's your MVP from the game last Sunday? MVP from the game. Wow, I, I think it's very difficult to to pick a guy. Uh, you know, I, and I kind of was thinking MVP so far for the first quarter of the season, realizing we're playing seventeen games, we still can say four uh, fourth uh, a quarter of the season, right? So CP would be the guy that came to mind for me in the way he's played. Uh, but I would have to say you've got two wins, and I would have to point to the veteran on the defense. I'm going to go Grady Jarrett. You I, shall not. I love it. I love when Arch pass. You guys, <laughs> exactly. you guys, you guys don't hear Arch do that. It is awesome. Grady, uh, so Grady gets the two key sacks, obviously, in the last two games, late in the football game when you needed him the most. I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, they kicked Grady outside uh, and, and played some five technique this week and, and coming off and, and kind of playing that edge defender. They're moving him around some, but he got one-on-one -on -one against Bentonio this, this weekend. Uh one of the only times they singled him and he got home and, and got the key sack. So you got two wins under your belt. Grady's played well all year long. And, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Grady, you know, maybe my MVP number two for the year. I think he's been pretty good from a leadership standpoint. But last weekend, needed a key moment. You needed one of your players to step up, and Grady did that. DJ, I'm going to throw this question to you, but it can be the same thing that Arch did. It could either be from the game or the first call it quarter of the season. You know, when we used to have 16 games and it was a season, it was really easy to do first quarter, halfway, <laughs> third quarter, end of season. So Hard now you got to kind of do a games, yeah. error thing a little bit. DJ, who you got? You know what? I'm going to jump and I'm going to do a little bit differently and I'm going to jump into the third phase and I'm going to go with my man Young Way. How about Young Way Koo? And how consistent he's been through these first four games. And even in the last ball game, dude had 11 points in the game versus the Browns. He's got 39 points on the season. And he's averaging 9.8 points a game. So you go into a game knowing, all right, we already got 10 points on the board. That puts you in a good feeling. So I like the consistency of Young Way Koo. I think we look around the league and you see a lot of kickers struggle. You see when you get inside the 40-yard line, some teams are not really – overly excited to put their field goal kicker on the on the field. And I think we have no reservations about putting Young Way Koo on the field and knocking down some big points when we need them and coming through with a big one in this ball game to to put us up 23-20, to 20, so it was big. 
Yeah, I think I agree. And, you know, it always puts a big smile on my face when you give somebody the nod. <laughs> I the know. Teams. I was really, I was really ah. waiting for you to look at long snapper, DJ. But I understand. you got to go with the guy. Next week, that next, ends week, up right. next week, next week, forward. next week. Um, I'll give you two quick ones. Arch, I'm going to agree with you on CP, Cordell Patterson, for the first quarter of the season. I think he's been a man-child, of course. We'll talk about him a little bit later being placed on IR, so some other players are going to have to step up. And speaking of other players stepping up, my MVP for the game is going to be Caleb Huntley. Guys, the game was kind of just like kind of like a boulder, just slowly moving along, right? And I believe – Midway through the quarter, third quarter, the Falcons had about 45 to 50 yards rushing. And then all of a sudden they brought Huntley on the field, gave him the rock a couple of times, and the complexion of the game completely changed. Mm. So I know I'm going to go a little off script here. Let's talk about offense. And Arch, um, did you see the same thing? It was like the offense couldn't really get things going. And then all of a sudden Arthur Smith decided to, you know what, we're going to just turn around and run the football. And boy, did that ever pay off. They just ended up pounding. And give some credit to the offensive line for the holes they were opening up up front. Absolutely, Rack. It's a good point. Uh, also throw Parker Hesse and Keith Smith and oh, some of those yeah. guys that are those edge blockers in it as well. But uh, And give Mariota some credit. Mariota creates a problem in the run game because of his ability to get out the backside. So some of those creases uh, increase, right? But the ferocity with which Caleb Huntley came in and ran the football, I can tell you exactly. Exactly when it was 306 third quarter <laughs> 306 left in the third quarter Huntley checked in at the running back spot we know CP got a little bit nicked in the in the first half wasn't able to go uh, Algier carried the bulk of the load through that time and then all of a sudden here comes Huntley in at 306 and they run the ball 10 consecutive times in the drive and Huntley finishes it off with that five yard touchdown run but I thought there was some resolve up front too you saw and I noticed on the sidelines I don't know if you guys picked it up as well there was a conversation going on, and somebody got really heated from a coaching standpoint, yelling and screaming at the big guys. And the big guys seemed to respond to that, and they started playing not just on Cleveland side of the line of scrimmage, deep in Cleveland side of the line of scrimmage. That second-level defense was getting ripped off or, or knocked off the ball. They had, had, they had a defensive idea that any time it looked like we were going to go zone read or RPO, they would blitz Kamara Mora, the linebacker. He mm -hmm. would come mm -hmm. to try to get in, in Mariota's face. Some of it had to do, and it disrupted some of the some of the really the pulls and throws because we didn't have we weren't accounting for Kamara Mora coming the linebacker. So give them some credit for their game plan. Nice adjustment. They went to a blocking scheme that took care of him in the run game, and he came off the ball. I agree with you, Rack. They came off the ball and changed the complexion of the game from a physicality standpoint. You just continue to pound the rock. And I think it's a great point, David. This is not one of those situations where the ball carriers were just doing a great job of making people miss. It was there were gashes, DJ, in the running game created by everybody that's blocking. And I think it's a great point from Dave's, not just the offensive line, the tight ends, the wide receivers that get involved in the run game. And of course, Mariota's ability to sometimes hold that backside edge defender because of his threat to come and run the run the football out of the backside. What else did you see offensively? DJ that was a difference maker in the game it's funny we bring this up because it was the subject of my Falcons film review today was the offensive line and how they were so physical and just the effort that they played with and we talked about the receivers tight ends I did four plays and all four plays you got Alameda Zacchaeus on one play cutting off the backside you got Drake London 15 yards down the field getting the most dangerous at one time, which is the safety. You got Kyle Pitts getting to the second level blocking uh, a linebacker. It was so many scenarios like that where – and even one, one – there was one Caleb Huntley run that I remember vividly, and Elijah Wilkerson, they're running outside zone to the right. Wilkerson is the backside guard. He runs 15 yards up the field trying to get the safety. He gets his second level defender. And he turns and he's looking for another guy. This is the effort that was showed in the run game. And it was four, five, six, seven, eight plays like this. We talk about the 10 plays of running the football. It was basically 9 7 The Browns knew we were running the football and could do nothing about it. The physicality in which you run uh, with those guys I thought was tremendous. Uh, I thought all those guys – really just put their foot in the ground, didn't dance too much, got vertical, got north and south, and they punish guys on the other side. So it was fun to watch those guys, you know, kind of work in conjunction together. And there was a play where 
Arch, you remember this? Avery Williams. Oh, and, I was hoping you did. You run, design this play. This run, is a great call. The run, run like a counter. Yeah, and you get Dalman. Dalman pulls around from the center spot, and he has, and he has the 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 seal block on the backside end. But the great thing about it was, at the point of attack, he was square, and I stopped it right on the video, and he was square. And now you give Avery Williams a two-way go. He can go inside, outside, and then this is another play with Drake. He goes down and he gets the safety, and it's now Avery Williams in the corner 25 yards down the field. It was an unbelievable play, unbelievable job of, Avery, of Dalman getting around there and sealing that block, and it, it was tremendous. Everybody was going right, and they come back with the counter. Just a tremendous oh, play call. I, I'm glad you brought that up, Shock. <laughs> I knew you were going to get to that play, so that's so cool because it was such a counter, and really it was a counter to what we were doing. We were running outside zone, 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 yep. and all of a sudden Dalman, everybody's going right. Dalman pulls back, and, and, and Shock described it perfectly, gets head up on that defender, that left – that defender that's there to take care of Mariota in the boot, right? Mm -hmm. That's why he's back there. Now here comes the center, this big center coming at him, fronts him up, and Avery's out the gate. I'm going to ask you guys this. Have people slept on Tyler Algier's acceleration? Oh, man. I, you know what I say, Rack? When he, when he says that, I think about the third down and 12th play. Falcons are in the bunch set. You got, you, you got Drake and you got Pitts there. And it was a quick read by Mariota. Gets the ball out of his hands, and he dumps it to him behind the line of scrimmage, and he picks up maybe, what, 15 yards? I mean, he literally just cuts through two people and gets a first down. But I think you're right, Arch. I think coming in, everybody looked at him as just a pure bruiser, bruiser back downhill physical. But he's shown some ability to, to, to turn on the wheels and, you know, kind of run away from people at times too. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, I uh, actually wrote that play down. I always like try to write the, down the key plays in the game, ones that I feel like as I'm watching it live are going to make a difference in the result. And that's one of the one I write. Third and 12 conversion to Algier for 20 yards on a screen pass. When a lot of times maybe it's just trying to turn a field goal, not try to make a, a, a disastrous mistake or something. And all of a sudden instead it's first down for Atlanta to continue the drive. One thing I want to note, we have two quarterbacks on this show. And I don't think I've seen you guys ever so excited <laughs> as you were talking about the one game, right? You guys are supposed to be talking about airing it out. So it's just, it's just miraculous that well, you well, guys right, just got right. so At the end of the I day, at the end of the day, we understand that the run game's going, we're going to better throw the rock. So we want that to be successful too. <laughs> <laughs> this episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search, so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. All right, so let's talk real quick. We mentioned it earlier. Cordell Patterson's going to go on IR, so we will not have his services for a few weeks. We already talked about the guys that we're likely going to see. And granted, it comes at a good time because there's a really good, fresh memory about the running game without CP in the lineup. Yes, he's probably been one of the MVPs to start the season. But Arch, how do you feel the Falcons' run game is going to be in the hands of Algier and Huntley moving forward for, let's call it, the next four weeks? I think the run game is going to be in good shape. The thing that, uh, and, and I think both those, we saw the violence with which they ran with. We saw the agility with which they, which they ran with. Shock talked about sprinkling Avery Williams in as well as a complimentary guy that can and I think those three guys will be able to handle the load you obviously lose CP's um, just the way he runs the ball downhill and hopefully and I think we saw Caleb Huntley run very similar to the way CP runs when he came in you mentioned it rack he came in with kind of a, a there was a different feel to him coming downhill mm -hmm. there wasn't this he found one cut which is the zone style of running and he pounded it down the field he said after the game I had a chance to talk to him on the radio post game and I asked him about getting an opportunity being called up. He found out on Friday there was a chance he was going to play, and they confirmed it on Saturday that he was going to be on the roster. And so CP and he talk, and he says, CP says, hey, man, you got to pick up the slack. He says, I got you, man. Now, he said it a little bit more colorfully than that on the radio, <laughs> but he said, I got you, and he did. He did, those two guys. And how about the distribution guys? For me, 
10 carries Algier. 10. 10 carries for Huntley. Yeah. 9 carries for CP. Yeah. 29 carries spread out over three backs, mm. and you ran for 200 yards. That's pretty mm-hmm. good. That's yeah. a pretty good distribution. And I, I asked Arthur in his show on the radio, I said, would that be ideal? He says, be perfect. If we could do that every <laughs> week and sprinkle it out, keep everybody fresh. And certainly they're going to have to do that this week. And Avery will be that third back that will be a part of that. DJ, anything else stick out of your mind is without having the services of Patterson? I mean, obviously he's a two-way threat. I mean, not three-way if you want to put him in the kicking game as well. It's I think it would be the wrong thing to say that they're not going to miss him because he's that impactful of a player. But yeah. they've got to have some confidence coming off of the way that this running game produced without him in the lineup last weekend. Uh, I think both you guys said everything that needs to be said, to be honest. I mean, those two backs came in and showed why – they felt good about, okay, let's go ahead and clean this up for CP. Let's go ahead and make sure he's good for the latter part of the season because we saw three guys get it done. We saw two guys, like you mentioned, have 10 carries apiece and rush the football in a way that gives them confidence. So I, I don't think there's anything else to say about it. Those guys will be ready to go. And, Arch, I heard you talking to him. He was excited yeah. to get his opportunity. He's he from was. here. He's, you know, been – he says he practiced like he's going to play. And I love the mindset that kid has going into a ball game and knowing that you're going to play the National Football League on a Friday or end up playing on a Saturday and to go out and have that kind of performance tells you this guy is a pro's pro. So Rack, you Rack, we've got uh, – there's a narrative starting to build a little bit, and I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit. Here we I'm go. Gonna, you, Let's go. I'm tired of hearing about the quarterback situation. Hey, should we play this guy or that guy? Let me tell you about Marcus Mariota and what he's doing. One of the reasons we talked about it in the run game, you're having some of these problems defending the run if you're the opposition, is because of him. His ability to get out of the pocket, his stuff off the RPO, his ability to get the ball out quickly. Yeah, I know, seven completions. I get it. You had seven completions. It's not good enough. Got to have better completions. He's not the only reason why there's only seven completions. Does he miss some throws? Absolutely. There's no question about it. Has has there been some snaps that he's got to hang on to? He's been... There's been some things he has to clean up. Sure. He made two throws. We both played the position. He made two throws in the game. There are probably about three guys or four guys playing in the league right now could have made. Yeah. The scramble to his left when he finds Hesse, mm-hmm. in, and that's an impromptu play. That's not a rollout. He's forced out of the pocket, and he With throws the ball off down his, on him. Yeah. Yeah, he's got two guys bearing down on him, getting ready to tear him in half. He lets it go to Hesse along the sideline that play. continues the drive. Yeah. And then the play he makes in the final drive to set up the field goal, OZ. going left with OZ going the other direction. If you go back and look at the tape, neither one of his feet are on the ground when he lets the ball go. He's sideways flipping it and gets it to OZ. Now, I get, I get it. OZ's – you got to get him the rock. No doubt. He gets him the rock. He gets upfield, face mask. Now you're in field goal range. So, let's – Let's pump the brakes a little bit on the Mariota bashing or whatever is going on. This guy's been incredible. Not only what he's doing in the locker room from a leadership standpoint, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. He changed a bunch of stuff in this game, guys. You guys know it. He changed a bunch of things in the game from a protection standpoint, run game standpoint. A lot of times when you come up the run game, there's a check with me. You know that, Shock. Kill at one side, flip at the other side, opposite, opposite, whatever you're going to do. He's doing that at the line of scrimmage. He's a veteran player that understands the looks. So I get it. You obviously need to clean up some stuff. Got to play better. But you're 2-2, two and two, and he's one of the reasons you're 2-2. Two and two, No question. Well, and I will say this. Another reason that they're 2-2 two and two is there's a whole other side of the football that probably deserves yeah. a little love. So let's talk about do defense. Michael Walker saying – after the game that this is a bend but never break defense and once again talked about some of the plays that I ended up writing down Richie Grant his solo tackle on Chubb when they tried to go hurry up on the first drive he gets that tackle then they go for it yeah. and the coverage sack ends up getting a stop right there that's a huge stop when a team tries to go hurry up if you find yourself out of position there's no way you end up making those plays of course the Hawkins force fumble that gets turned over Uh, and Cordell Patterson ends up scoring. Like All these little plays stack up throughout the course of the game. Dave, Brown's just two for five in the red zone. What are some of the other big moments in that game that you felt like the defense made outside of the Grady Jarrett sack at the end? Well, and let me point out one other little thing that not on the defensive side. Tyler Algier on the final run that puts you in field goal range or gives you the chance to kick 
Tyler Algier stays in bounds. How many rookies know to gear down and get on the ground right there? Just yeah. a little thing, and you were pointing out some little things. Defensively, Cleveland is one of the best three-count screen teams in the National Football League. They tried to screen, I think, seven or eight times in the game, and we blew every one of them up. Incomplete They're trying, yeah, yeah, incomplete. And the <laughs> one they completed to Njoku, Hawkins came in and banged the ball out, and you got the ball in a short field opportunity. They were incredible. The, the extension of their run game, with those two guys running it and Hunt and Chubb, is their screen game to those two guys and the tight end. Completely took that they away had from the game. on that one too. So. Yeah, completely. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> completely took away the screen game, which I thought stuck out. That was, and I'll give you one ser- one series real rack, and I'll get out of here so Shaw can talk. We had a drive. We we think about the final drive where where Grady gets a sack and D gets the pick. All right. Go back to the series prior to that. I mentioned the Algier getting down in bounds. Arthur Smith mentioned this to me on his coach's show. Algier gets on the ground. They have to burn a timeout. Their last timeout. Yeah. Okay. They get the ball back. No timeouts left on the board. And they're trying to move it. They get out to the Falcon 48-yard line, first down. They throw it. They, they run a pass, run, run the ball, I believe. They had to get on the ball right away because they had no timeouts. Mm-hmm. They didn't have any timeouts. Algier made sure they didn't have any timeouts. And so you get, you get them off the field three straight downs at the 48-yard line. They don't get into field goal range to put you under the gun on your drive that you're down. Yeah. Now you get the football back tied. I thought that that series of downs there right before the final drive was a huge one. And nobody will talk about it, right. but you got to stop at midfield to get the ball back. Mm. DJ, who stuck out to you? Because I go back and I think about watching the game and and listening to the broadcast, and it's almost like every player on the defense at some point made a play to get his name mentioned. The the Michael Walkers, the Lorenzo Carters, obviously Grady Jarrett, Hawkins in the secondary, Alfred. It seems like this was a total team effort. Maybe not dominant. Yes, they did end up shutting down the screen game, which was huge. But what stuck out to you is some of the biggest plays defensively that helped secure the win. Uh, I think Lorenzo had a big play on a batted screen again uh, in the ball game. And he, he brought a lot of pressure in the game as well. I thought he's been, you know, very active in his play over the first four games, which is, you know, big what you want outside of getting sacks. Uh, I think the number one thing is – you knew Chubb was going to get his. You knew they were going to force feed him. He got his numbers, but you didn't allow everybody else to beat you. Think about it. Early in the ball game, they were feeding Joku. He was getting all kind of receptions all over the place. Second half, he may have had one catch, I may believe, and you force him into that fumble. You know, uh, obviously in the ball game. But I thought the red zone defense. I thought your ability to take away all their. Other guys, mm. you knew Chubb was going to get it, but you didn't allow Kareem Hunt to go out here and rush for 100 yards or catch another 75 yards in the pass game. But I thought biggest things was, hey, we talked about it, forcing that forcing that turnover on downs. Then they had another time inside the red zone, and I mean within the five, and you force a field goal. Bend but not break was absolutely what this defense was about and gave the Falcons a chance to, to really stay in this ball game and put the pressure on them late in the game. But I thought not allowing your other guys on their side to win in this game. Because you always say, hey, they always got a star. They're going to make plays. They're an NFL team. But you don't allow two, three, four of the guys to have a big game to contribute to the one that's already going. By the way, A.J. Terrell put uh, a guy named Amari Cooper in witness protection, Woo! I think. I think he had, what do you have, one Woo! grab in the yeah. game? I didn't even, I don't think I ever mentioned his name yeah. on the radio. Now, it's, the superlatives are throwing out, rightly so, guys. But there are things to fix. We talked a little bit about the offense. Defensively, you got to tackle better. Oh, yeah. They, they did not tackle overly well in this game. There were a number of plays. They were in position to make plays, and it ended up being five or six more yards, which allowed Cleveland to convert. No question about that. So I think, And, and then that the pin and pull, you're going to see that now. Yeah. You're going to see counter tray or pin and pull rack where they're going to pin down and they're going to pull those two guys around. Cleveland had tremendous amount of success. Now it's a bread and butter play for them. A lot of teams can't run that. I don't know if Tampa can duplicate that, but we know it's a copycat league. You're going to see it unless you can stop it. So there are some things to fix. It's not perfect, but they're playing four quarters and they're finding a way to win games. All right, well, let, let's talk a little bit about that, Dave, because you mentioned we, we faced a team in Cleveland last weekend that wanted to pound the rock and arguably one of the top running backs in the league in Nick Chubb, and things are going to change this week. 
All right, you got Leonard Fournette, who has basically taken the lion's share of the snaps in the backfield for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but now they're going to go up against the GOAT, arguably one of the best passers in the history of the National Football League with a guy named Mike Evans that knows how to go up and catch the ball. Now, you look at Tampa Bay, guys, and it's almost like the tale of two seasons. I call it um, before Sunday night football against Kansas City and then the game against Kansas City because the Chiefs just dominated them by running the football and basically doing whatever they wanted, forcing Tom Brady to basically throw the entire game through the air. So, Dave, what are the Falcons going to face this weekend and some of the things that need to get cleaned up that could get exposed against the Buccaneers? Yeah, number one is going to be the tackling. You're going to have to tackle in space because they're going to get Fournette the football in a lot of different ways. They're throwing it to him. They're handing it to him. Uh, They saw what Chubb had some success in that you're going to probably get an opportunity to to stop the pin and pull and try to get get him on the ground there. The short passing attack is a big deal. Brady gets the ball out pretty quickly unless he's going to hold it to throw the ball down the field to Evans. That's a tough matchup for A.J. Terrell. On the other side, they got run on. You mentioned it, Rack. Kansas City doesn't necessarily come in thinking, okay, we're going to run the rock. They did yeah. in the game against against a team that has a reputation for being one of the best run defenses in the league. You can bet that Devin White and Levante David, all they're hearing is how they got the run ball run on them, and here comes the team that just ran for 200, 200 yards. yards. Yeah. What do you think they're going to try to stop? <laughs> they're going to gang up on the run. So uh, to me, that really gives you an opportunity. They're willing to play some man coverage in the secondary, and frankly, I don't think they're good enough to do that. So I think you're going to get some opportunities. Got to be willing to take those shots with Pitts and London and some of the OZ uh, get one-on-one against some of those guys down the field. And DJ Falcons will get a chance to face a couple of former Falcons. Of course, Julio Jones, Russell, Russell Gage, both down in Tampa. Both guys have been a little bit dinged up and, and necessarily, haven't necessarily had great seasons yet. But what sticks out to you about this Tampa matchup for Atlanta to be able to continue some of this momentum that they developed last weekend? You bring up two guys who's, who are former players. So Gage right now is the most targeted guy for Tom Brady right now. I know they have a couple guys out and, you know, Gage's been in and out, but he's the most targeted guy for him. So, you know, he has a familiarity already with Russell Gage, so you got to make sure that you know where Gage is. But I I think the number one thing coming to this game versus Tampa on the road is kind of similar to what you've already done. It's not a a different sauce you got to come into this ballgame with because you've done all the things to keep you in these ballgames and win the last two. But one thing that sticks out to me is you had one penalty versus the Browns. One penalty. That one nice. penalty came versus, versus Drake London when he was, you know, trying to fight a guy off and got the face mask off. You have to be disciplined versus a team like this. And then defensively, I think it's what you've done, which is you've gotten the football away in four consecutive games. You forced them to turn the football over. And if you could do that, take some possessions away from them and then turn it over to your offense where your offense versus in all four games have moved the football without a problem. I don't expect it to be a problem this week as well. So uh, I think continue to be disciplined on the road is always a big factor, and win that turnover margin is always huge. And you can say that probably in every ball game. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the penalty, DJ, because that was one of the. I'll show you guys real quick. Here's here's my sheet of notes that I wrote down with all the stuff from the, <laughs> the Falcons game. How do you read that? One of them. <laughs> I have on the right just one penalty for 15 yards, and you're right. I mean, I feel like th- th- there's some areas that they're going to have to make sure that they end up performing really well in no penalties, convert in the red zone, no turnovers, keep stealing the football away on defense and special teams, and they'll definitely have a chance in this game. So, Arch, DJ, how are we feeling, guys? Like, I-, I love the energy today. I love yeah. the excitement, the enthusiasm that you guys brought. When's will bring when will bring that to you? It's a fun. Hey, you're on top of the division, guys. Who give me someone out there that's a supposed quote unquote expert that had Said Atlanta tied with Tampa yeah. for the division lead None. after four weeks. None. Zero. Nobody. So go back home. Stay back. Okay. <laughs> Don't jump now, on that, baby. Don't jump by on. the way, rivalry weekend this weekend for Shock and I, Farmageddon. Uh, K State coming to Iowa State. Uh, Big one. Big one. The oldest Deep South rivalry, Auburn, Georgia. Is Minnesota playing for like a sow's ear or a, or a cow's <laughs> bell or something this week? Who's Minnesota playing? Some animal most likely will be on the line for whoever Minnesota plays this week. And honestly, I don't know. I'm in London. I haven't checked it out. <laughs> hey, guys. 
Uh, that's going to uh, wrap it up for us this week. I appreciate you guys bearing with me here in London. Uh, I am not going to go get fish and chips. I might go find some tea and crumpets or something like that. Go back to the um, cute but, coffee uh, place. That's what, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> Put your pinky up and all. Might, Emma. I'm not going to do my UK <laughs> accent because I'm absolutely going to blow it. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's going to do it here uh, for the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Hopefully we're back with the same energy, same enthusiasm next week after a Falcons victory. That'll do it for us. Thank you for watching on all the different avenues that you check out your podcast. Don't forget, like, subscribe, review, and continue to check us out here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks, everyone. How about Captain Rackley? He's international, baby. Go, baby.